Hi everybody, um, you might notice I'm getting a little dishevelled and tired, it's been a rough couple of days um, and I'm currently at the vet waiting for the vet to come back with my boy Tiny who isn't so good but he's something of a miracle. That was some really sad news to tell you. Um, as you know, our animals roam free, most of them, the birds, and they are very, very carefully shut up at night. And in return for their freedom, we do lose some to things like buzzards, you know, birds of prey during the day. But it's usually just a few over the year and we accept that, you know, it's part of living in the wild and them having their freedom as well. What we don't expect is foxes attacking in the middle of the day, right next to the house. Um, and that's what happened on Saturday. We got home to find our beautiful turkey Dave missing and tiny and some dead chickens around. And we couldn't find them. We searched and we searched and we searched. Uh, day, the rest of the daytime and into the night. Went to bed broken hearted. And um, the next morning the cows escaped, and which is a whole other story. Mark went out in the ranger looking for them a bit further and he found deep into the forest some of beautiful Dave's feathers confirming he'd been taken. But incredibly, he found Tiny alive, and Tiny is my baby. I hand raised him about six years ago because he was the runt of the litter. It's quite funny, he's called Tiny because now he's enormous. He's a very rare breed, Norfolk Grey hen, uh, cockerel. Tiny was alive, he'd been dragged down, he was badly injured, but I have nursed chickens back from um, fox attacks before. And he was doing all right, but then I just got back from doing some shopping and um, he was really droopy and not eating and he's very hot, so he's clearly got a really nasty infection, which often happens from um, fox bites. And so the vet who's just down the road is very kindly offered to take us and I've come straight down with him and I'm just, oh, I'm hoping he survives. It would be the one thing that would stop me really falling to pieces over our beautiful turkey. I know there are big problems in the world and a lot of tragedy and it pales into comparison to lose a turkey, but he was a part of our lives daily for over four years. Like he was always at the door. He followed us everywhere. He's on TV with us. He was in every meeting. He used to join the architect meetings. Um, he was the sweetest, sweetest bird you could ever meet. He just, he never pecked anybody. And he was just such a lovely bird. I'd just go in the chicken run and cuddle him at night. Just put my arms around him because he was so lovely. And I'm very, very sad that he's gone. So um, hopefully I'll have good news for you about my boy here. He's still with us for the moment. And luckily he's very tame and he loves nothing more than being on my lap. So if this was um, a non-tame bird, I wouldn't be handling them because that would put them under more stress. But um, he loves his mommy's cuddles. <laughs> he's suddenly gone really downhill. Like he can't stand up anymore. I'm just trying to get him to drink as much as possible. Just hope the vet's finished soon. Oh, oh baby. Oh, boy. Oh. Well, there was a bit of a fraught time at the vet's. Um, the vet was very delayed and I got more and more worried that Tiny was going to die. At one point, um, I put him on the floor and the water 
came out of his mouth. Um, and when the vet came, he was very kind, but he um, said that he didn't have an awful lot of hope for him because he might have internal injuries because he discovered that there was a huge injury on his breast, which I hadn't seen. I thought it was just his back. But he gave him an antibiotic injection because he was very, very clearly had a high, high fever because fox teeth are not very clean. And he gave me some other antibiotics to give him and the other hen who was attacked and survived um, every morning. So it could take a while to show how he's doing, but I'm just gonna keep hoping, keep him indoors, keep getting him to drink water and uh, see how he gets on. Obviously with what's happened with the birds and uh, trying to save the ones that were injured, we've been a bit distracted from our work on the coach house. So what I'm going to do this week, whilst we're waiting for Tiny and the others to get better, is show you around exactly where we are with the project because it's been quite a while since we did that. We had the daily videos last summer. We've done quite a lot of videos since and you might have sort of forgotten where we are in the progress and what we still need to do. As you know, we had a bit of a break from filming before um, and during that time, we did actually make quite a lot of progress. And one of the things that Mark is most proud of is the chimney on the coach house. And he and Fabrice built a stone chimney, which will take the smoke from the wood burner downstairs. And they did a very special design on the top, which echoes ones that we've seen in the Alps. And so it's got a little hat on there. And I have to say that every time we see the smoke curling out of this, it makes us feel very happy. And we think it just really sets off uh, the look of the coach house because it's really dominant in front of the chateau and it needs to look nice and in keeping. There are obviously a lot of things which need finishing but we don't have the time to do before if we want to move in soon but they're totally possible to live with so as we go around today I'm going to show you the things we're going to live with but still need to do and the things that we have to do before we can move in. This is the bathroom of the second bedroom. Now, because we are one family and we're only going to be using one bathroom at a time, this is not going to be a priority. I've got really big plans for it, but we're going to do that once we've moved in. Likewise, this room, which is the beautiful mural room, is not going to be our principal bedroom. This will be where we have a sort of upstairs living room. It's where we'll store the clothes. It'll still look nice but it's not going to be the place that we sleep in. Therefore, things like the lights um, and finishing off bits and pieces in here, they don't matter so much before we move in. Obviously, if in the other room we buy a bulk lot of something, we'll do both rooms at the same time. But I think for the moment, we've got spotlights up there. We need to look for a big light in the ceiling. Um, there's not an awful lot left to be done apart from the doors but um, it's not our priority before we move in. This is bedroom number one. Uh, we named it so, I think, well, okay, we named it for no reason whatsoever, but it has always been in my mind that this is where we will sleep because it's on the west side of the coach house, which means that there will be less sun during the day coming in and less heat on the walls. Um, and less heat on the windows, which means it will be cooler in the summer, which is quite important for us because we're going to be here mostly over this year's summer. I really love this room. It's slightly nestled into the forest and there's really dappled light that comes in. And I would love to have this room properly finished before we move in. And there are a few key things that we're left with. There's some quite boring stuff, like we need to find covers for the electrical sockets. Um, and we need to find sort of corner lights in here. But one of the big things we've been discussing is what we do about the central light. Because in a room with ceilings this high, you'd think you need something quite large to fill that space in the center of the ceiling. But at the same time, a chandelier, which would be, you know, being in France and being in a chateau would be our choice. 
would look a little bit too fancy for a more rustic coach house, particularly as there are all still all of these old features from when the stable boy used to live up here that we kept. So we were in a coffee shop the other day and they had an amazing upside down basket, basically. It was absolutely huge and it sat in the middle of the ceiling and we thought, wow, something made of a natural fibre like that would look incredible in here. So we're absolutely on the search for a basket uh, light fitting for the middle of the room and I hope we find it soon. Another reason for using this room as our bedroom to begin with is that it won't have the early morning light in the summer and light is something we're going to have a few issues with because you can see these beautiful, beautiful window openings that we had so carefully restored. You don't want to be covering that with a, um, with a curtain rail or something. That wants to be the just absolutely pride of the room. But at the same time, if we were to put a curtain rail or a, um, a roller on the window, we wouldn't be able to open the windows. And in the summer, we sleep with the windows open at night. Um, so it's been a bit of an issue. And what we've decided to do is have shutters made for the outside. Um, but that will have to be for the entire coach house. And so we'll be able to close shutters at night and we'll have the ones that have little louvers in them which let the airflow come through, um, which is exactly what we had in the Caribbean when we lived there. Um, although we don't have fly screens, which I know winds up an awful lot of our North American viewers, but we just don't have enough insects to warrant them and they obscure this beautiful view and they get dirty and I just, just don't like them. Um, but with shutters in, it will, it will be able to shut out the light but let the airflow come in. Obviously, with all of the amount that we'd need for here, that's quite a big job. It'll take time, it'll take quite a lot of money. Uh, so please watch the adverts. <laughs> and so we need to wait for that. But in the meantime, if we sleep on this side of the building, it means we won't be woken up like five o'clock in the morning in the summer. Um, and it should be manageable. One of my favourite elements of the upstairs here in the coach house was that we decided to have little window seats under the main windows. And over here, we have a hollow area. The other one's a solid stone, but this is the entry point for the underfloor heating that comes in here and possibly other forms of heating. But obviously we need to cover this up. So we're going to do some sort of either a seat box to look like the other underfloor heating, or we may just put a cupboard under there so that we can have plants or something. Um, this is not essential for us to move in, but it would be really nice. It would just be the last little icing on the cake to make it look beautiful in here. This, of course, is the bathroom we've been working on recently, and it's just off of the bedroom we're going to be sleeping in. And the reason uh, we wanted to use this bathroom rather than the other one to begin with is because there will be a real bath here, which is crucial with small children. Uh, we've finished painting the panelling in here. Uh, we've decided to do it all the same colour, not to do a different colour around the top because um, it's a smaller room and with too many different elements, it gets a bit fussy. So in here, um, we have to do some interesting things to make the sink level and fit the tiles, grout the tiles, do some other decoration work that I'm going to save as a treat to show you another week. And we need to have all of the uh, white goods installed. So there's still quite a lot in here. Um, and one of the big delays in here is us trying to get hold of our plumber to do all the connecting up and installation of the white goods. Um, he is extremely in demand because he's very, very good. And we have a call in with him and we are pestering him on an almost daily basis. Uh, but essentially, once we have running water in here and we have a toilet and a sink, is when we can actually move in if we look at the essentials. But whilst we're waiting for him, I really would like to get the decorative, decorative side done. You might remember last summer that Guillermo, a wonderful Argentine um, volunteer, painted this bath and it, it sat outside for rather a long time. And the one thing that's left on here is the legs. 
need to know what to do with the legs and what colour. And we're still debating this. We're not huge fans of the metallic paints, the golds, the silvers. Uh, we think it still needs to retain its history. And in the past, um, most of them would have just been painted the same colour as the bath or the room or left like this. Uh, so we've got to make a few decisions about paint colours. And also Mark told me that the overflow pipe has some rather large holes in it. And although you hope that the overflow pipe is not used a huge amount, it would be good to uh, fill those holes. And they are, um, it's a lead pipe. So there are some complications in how to fill those holes. One thing up here is the entrance door that we need to do, apart from all the other doors. And uh, it was, it's the original door that we had to adapt and put a piece of wood at the bottom. And it's not very pretty, but it's very characterful. And we need to start thinking about how we can retain the historical character of it whilst actually making it slightly more beautiful, but also crucially more functioning, which involves putting a lock that we can lock on it and filling some gaps around the door so that the wind doesn't come whistling through it like it does today. Right, there's going to be some shame in this room because the last thing you saw about the downstairs was us finishing, actually making it look quite nice and having all the furniture in and things. But since that time, it has been used as a chaotic summer room uh, with kids playing and then even more disruptive, Mark put all of his plants in here to overwinter, the big ones, the, the very tall ones, and there's just mess everywhere. And then the kids came in and compounded it. So I've got something of a task on my hands to sort this room out again. One of the things I'm really pleased with, though, is that I managed to score us a free sofa which means that we don't have to buy a brand new sofa for here uh, when the kids are going to be running in and out with their muddy shoes and things like that. Um, and also not something that we would then not use in the main house because that's a bit wasteful. So in return for us going to pick it up when someone was moving house in Lyon, um, we, we got it for free. And I'm very pleased with it. But, I mean, it's not the most beautiful. It's fairly functional and I've got a few ideas about how I might jazz it up a little bit to uh, just make it uh, look a bit more pleasing. One of the problems I've had um, keeping this tidy also has been that I still needed to use it as my clay station down here. But um, over on Patreon we've been showing how I've been setting up a medium term pottery studio on the top floor of the chateau. And so very soon I'm going to be moving the rest of my stuff from here. Um, I've got some new equipment coming very excitedly and that will free up this whole area um, and then really all we need is a good clean and uh, to move some more furniture into here. The same really goes for the kitchen dining area. It's pretty much ready. We just need the kitchen to be hooked up to the water supply when our plumber comes and to move in all of the furniture that we want. But, you know, realistically, you can do that kind of thing in a day. But the big thing that we have to have done, because there is no communicating staircase between the ground floor and the top floor, we need a working toilet. And uh, I don't know if you remember me plastering this and screaming at the spiders, of which there are still. Uh, but we need the toilet installed in here and we uh, need to turn our attention back to this fabulous big plank of wood. Um, I'm going to link you back to the video of this to explain where it comes from, the incredible history of it and what we've done so far. And this is going to be then the sink that we install here. Um, we've been standing in here quite a lot recently debating things and mulling ideas over. But this really is going to be quite a challenge that we need to face in the next two or three weeks. Welcome to the most pampered cockerel in the world, or rooster, as you may know. Um, it's now Thursday, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, three days since he was rushed to the vet. And look at him. Apart from the lack of tail and a small limp, you really wouldn't know that he'd um, 
been dragged 100 metres into the forest by fox and left overnight to die. You're my good boy. You're my good boy. Um, thankfully, he still likes cuddles, but apart from that, he's completely back to normal. Uh, well, I mean, he is still quite weak and I'm still pampering him like a little prince, but I think this is one of the most miraculous recoveries I've ever seen amongst our birds and animals. I mean, he was at death's door in the vet surgery. He sort of collapsed and there was water leaking from his mouth and it's given us something to focus on with the loss of our poor turkey, um, which did hit us very hard. He's been this incredible presence in our lives for so many years. He was there when Clement was born and Juliet was born. Um, he's always at the door. He was a hand-raised turkey. So Mark found him at a plant fair and the lady who'd hand raised him couldn't keep him anymore, but she wouldn't let him go to anybody other than a wonderful home. And he thought he was human. And that's why we couldn't keep him caged. Uh, he would have been so sad. He just wanted to be with us wherever we were. I remember him um, standing in the middle of an architect's meeting once when we were planning the coach house and he just stood in the middle of all these builders just joining in with the conversation. And when we were filmed for TV, he was always there. And uh, a lot of you might have opinions that we should have kept him and some of the others caged, but we kept them safe at night. Uh, they had um, big solid walls that we made a lot of effort on. And we did not wish to restrict them in small um, caged areas for their whole lives. And unfortunately, having the best of both worlds is very, very difficult, if not impossible, especially when you have a mix of species. So we made our choices. He had an amazing life. Um, I still cry whenever I think of him um, and miss him a lot. But as a big meat bread turkey, he was already living beyond his years because they often collapse and die of heart attacks within a year or two because they're bred not to need to live any longer than that. Um, so at least I've got my boy here. Uh, he's six years old already. Um, and I'm gonna keep him so safe. And actually without the turkey, the solution to some of the housing will be a lot more simple um, because of sizes and diseases and things like that. So we're going to work on some um, some other enclosures for them in different places um, that we can hopefully solve the situation. But ultimately, we live in the wild. We live right next to the forest. There are wolves here, foxes, badgers, stone martins, numerous birds of prey. And it's just a fact of life that sometimes they will slip past our defences. Even when we have a gigantic shepherd dog outdoors, supposedly looking after them. Uh, thank you for all of your lovely words. And we'll be back um, in the next episode tonight um, on our Lost Gardens of Chateau de Rosier channel uh, with some amazing developments in Mark's greenhouse transformation project. So please hang on here after this premiere um, and go straight to that one. Or if you haven't um, joined us at the premiere, please do check out the Lost Gardens of Chateau de Rosière. Some of the videos on there have recently taken off and we're so proud about how they've been received and how people are enjoying the work that's going on in our estate. Mm -hmm.